welcome to the continuation of Elevate Rapid City's virtual trainings. Uh, we're really glad you're joining today. Um, this has been a series that has um, been ongoing since the pandemic started. Uh, this specifically is a Ascent Innovation Client Spotlight uh, centered on a client uh, here in the Ascent Innovation Incubator. Uh, we've been doing these in person uh, since spring. Uh, oh, banner is cut off, adjust your screen. Orders. Right, marching orders. Thanks to my <coughs> background staff for, for keeping us in line there. Uh, all right, let's try again. Uh, anyway, so uh, we had a spotlight. Uh, we've been doing in-person every month since last spring. Uh, and then uh, at the start of the pandemic, we thought, well, let's just keep doing them virtually. Um, so uh, <coughs> you can see all of the previous ones as well as this one on the Elevate Rapid City YouTube channel. Make sure you just subscribe for updates and then also check out the Elevate Rapid City Dot com website for information on uh, other resources and future virtual trainings. My name is Mitch Nightingale. I'm the Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for Elevate Rapid City and also the Director of the Ascent Innovation Incubator. Um, today I'm joined by Gordon Drysdale of Black Hills Information Security. I'm going <clears> to <throat> let him introduce himself in just a second. Um, this is the second time we've had uh, a spotlight with Black Hills Information Security. Uh, we did one in person last July. Um, they've been a, a tenant of ours for a few years now and just doing some fantastic things. Uh, and I'm looking through my notes and, oh, we're going to have to talk about this, Jordan. Um, if you haven't seen the Elevate Rapid City magazine, uh, there's, there's Jordan on the, on the back page with an article about him. Uh, gardening is something we're going to talk about here shortly. But uh, okay. looking forward to it. Um, so I'm really excited for you to be here, Jordan. Uh, you, if you could start, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be in the Black Hills. Sure. I was actually born and raised here. Born almost 40 years ago now. Uh, went to high school here. Spent a good majority of my youth trying to stay out of trouble. I'm not sure how great a job I did at that. I went to Colorado State University in 99. Spent six years trying to get a four-year degree because it was such a you know great town to hang out in. Got hired directly out of my degree, which was uh, business administration and then focus on computer information systems at Hewlett Packard. And not because I knew anything about computers, but really because Say habla espanol. So I got hired as a technical translator there, worked myself into a technical role at HP, and then moved back here in 2010 with a couple kids in tow. Got moving expenses from NAU, got hired at a managed service provider here. And if you don't know what a managed service provider is, this is a company that will basically offer a pool of IT technicians to a company for some monthly rate. And that is to avoid you having to ROI the cost of an employee who may not know everything about technology, to fill in some gaps, deploy systems and services for you, <clears throat> really serve as that CIO role for companies who can't afford it. And then got hired here at Black Hills in 2000, end of 2015. And I've been a pen tester, sysadmin, and recently started a new company we call Defensive Origins, which is kind of a child of BHIS but is my own. So we have fantastic support from, you know, John and ownership here. That company was founded explicitly to provide training services to better inform the general public. Okay. Security matters. Cool. So let's get into that in a minute, Jordan. Why don't you yeah. first, um, for those that weren't on our last spotlight, tell us a little bit about Black Hills Information Security. And I'm going to adjust our screen just slightly. Yeah, yes. no problem at all. So Black Hills InfoSec was founded in 2008 by John Strand, who had one employee at that point. Him and his wife basically said, this is, all, this is all crazy out here. What we're doing now isn't working. The Black Hills is quiet and peaceful, and let's head that way. And so John came out, who was also a previous resident of Rapid City. I think he went to St. Thomas More. One of the, so he's been around here a long time, too. So he was a Black Hills native, came back out from Colorado, where he had been uh, an employee of Northrop Grumman, maintained lots of clearances. And so he had... He had been provided this background by Northrop Grumman with clearance as a forensic investigator, as a systems detective, someone who could really find the root cause of problems on networks really effectively. So he started Black Hills InfoSec, hired someone, and really it has blossomed into you know, one of the top three or four pen test firms in the U.S. at this point. A little more about that. Um, 
and testing and kind of sure. what your team does around the world day to day or yeah. project. <clears throat> and that is a good point, right? We are global. So there's probably eight or 10 employees here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. About eight or 10 employees here in, in the South Dakota area, pretty much West River. But we have 50 employees spread around the U.S., a couple in Michigan, a couple in Florida. There's, there's just there's people spread all over. And what happens is a customer will come to us and say, hey, we want to improve our security posture. We want you to break in and act like an adversary. And then really we want you to help us along the way figure out what we did wrong, how we can get better, and improve our posture. So we get hired by a lot of companies to just break in and act like an adversary and then produce hopefully a meaningful report. It seems like our reports are pretty good because we get a lot of return customers. I think it's 60% of our customers are return customers. So, yeah. So act as an adversary, I, mean, I, I know you're gonna get into all the details, but you're essentially hacking into their system both digitally and yep. sometimes physically, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of us miss the physical testing. Okay. Because those just turn out to be some of the some of the best stories we tell each other yeah. over time. And yeah, for example, a company hires us and they pick out a bunch of a la carte services. Let's call it Ascend Innovation comes to us and says, we want a physical pen test, we want an external pen test, and we want to know about our web application. So we will come over to Ascent, we'll hang around, we'll see if we can identify anybody wearing badges, we'll see if we can figure out what the entry systems look like, where the doors are. And we'll mimic whatever we can. If everybody's wearing suits and ties, guess what? We will put on suits and ties. If everybody's wearing jeans and shorts, we're gonna to try to blend in and break in and then find your sensitive documents. We're gonna steal computers from you. We're gonna find your maintenance vehicles and try to find the keys and drive off in them and park them down the road, take pictures of ourselves. You know, We have a lot of selfies in vehicles from maintenance lots. It's, it's pretty wild actually. So spy level, I think I mentioned in the article, like some days it is spy level. Yeah. It sounds like Ocean's Eleven type stuff to me. Like I, I just, I, yes. Every time I hear you talk about it, it just is so fascinating. So. Sometimes. And then, okay, for example, let's, let's carry on. You want an external test. Now, this is us working much closer, but I come to you and I say, hey, Mitch, what is your website address? Where are your employee login portals? What IP addresses do you or your IT providers manage? And we... Definitely not low and slow, but we scan, we enumerate, and then we try to break in in every way we can. Wow. And a value to us for sure. Oh, absolutely. Without, without a doubt. I, I just can't imagine that, especially in the Midwest. You know, if you came in with a, a painting shirt on and said, hey, I'm supposed to paint your server room today, I'd be like, oh, sure. Yeah. Here's a key, and can I get you a cup of coffee? <laughs> you know, like I, I, I can imagine there's some trusting, you know, I mean, it could be done. It is like that. Yeah. So the ladder, you, you make a great case. People open doors for you if you have a ladder, even if it's a four foot folding ladder. <laughs> if it's a locked door and you knock on it and you say, hey, you know, paint shirt and ladder, you would be surprised. I'm sure. And it's terrifying, really, because we're there to demonstrate risk. And there is risk in us being Midwest friendly. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the pen testing is kind of... EHIS, I understand it, but now you've kind of spun off in terms of training and also fixes for those, you know, those repeat customers have come back and said, okay, how do we fix it, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. So that, that brings up a company that was born directly here from BHIS and is called Active Countermeasures. That company was formulated on the mathematical prowess of the interns we were getting out of mines. So we have had so much support from this building, from Ascent, from the school of minds in that we were able to bring in students who were math, math degrees, right? These are not computer science people. These are people with math degrees who can come in and look at streams of data and make sense of it and wow. then find adversaries in, in that noise. So that is another company. Yes. And then training. We have so many people coming to us right now saying, Hey, we didn't catch you. Why didn't we catch you? How do we get better? Can you train our employees? So now we have four or five spinoff organizations, of employees at BHIS because John says, all right, all of you, take your after hours time and build some training classes. We have a lot of people who need um, a lot of information. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you, especially now in a more virtual world than ever, probably more predators out there and I'm sure you're not bored. Yeah, we are definitely not bored. We are booking pretty much through the end of the year at this point. Wow. We're telling customers that come to us and ask for contracts at this point, 
we have a project manager who can work miracles. We'll try. Yeah. Right. And we don't have many people dropping right now. We kept expecting with all the chaos going on around us, right? The virus and economic, who knows what we kept expecting to run off a cliff and that contracts would drop. But no, as you say, predators are up. We're still seeing massive ransomware attacks. I think John told me last weekend he was working on an IR engagement and, and we don't do incident IR. We don't do incident response very often, but we are starting to get a lot of calls, which is pushing us to say, is it time for us to invest in incident response? Or, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's been wild, <clears throat> truly. And I know you guys, for a lot of reasons, don't market a ton and, you know, you definitely don't talk about your clients, but I mean, you've worked for some, some huge names and, and you're considered one of the top in your industry, as I understand yes. it, aren't you? That is the truth. And at this point, we, we don't really market in a traditional sense. We don't need to. We don't do much paid advertising at all. But that is because of our reputation in industry. So when we test a few law firms, all of those law firms go, holy cow, that was an amazing test. Or we test a few banks, holy cow, that was the most thorough you know, assessment we've ever had. They tell all their other banks, and then we get a bunch of banking customers coming in. We get a bunch of law firms. And so I think two out of three of my tests were law firms who had spoken with each other and said, BHIS is amazing. Yeah, it's, it's been really, it's been amazing to be a part of that growth, just to see us spread around. And that's a fantastic story and of a homegrown Black Hills company, for sure, and yeah. being that, that kind of level of, of recognition around the world and in your industry, so that's awesome. Yeah, it is, it is global at this point. <clears throat> uh, so you, you alluded to a little bit, talk a little bit more about up next for your team. I mean, maybe having to get an instant response and active countermeasures, yep. um, all those um, what do you, where do you see us see you going next few years? Yeah, we hope we hope the economics don't get in our way. Yeah, there's nothing. There's really nothing we can do about that broader global macro picture. We hope checks keep cashing and that we can continue, you know, our, our lateral growth, our you know move into different markets, like you say, like active countermeasures does something that BHIS just does not do. And it was a demand in the marketplace, right? right? It's, it's so many people coming to us now and saying, we need incident response. Who does it? And us throwing contracts over the fence to our, we don't really have competitors. We have friends in industry. So we throw contracts over the fence. We keep saying, oh, is it time? Is it time? And from a growth perspective, I think, you know, active countermeasures is going to keep growing just because, you know, the network threat hunt is kind of a hot term. So lots of people want threat hunts on their network now, and that's really what Active Countermeasures is great at. I mean, I have obviously know what sure. that means, but yeah, that's fine. Else. And, and and threat hunting really these days is going into a network, working with an IT operator, sysadmin, or managed service provider, right? Who, whoever is running the systems at an organization, we work with them to do blue team activities. Like, what does the network traffic flow look like? Have you been patching your systems effectively? And then like an actual perspective of network data. So point A to point B, we intercept and then we analyze that with those mathematics that came out of here, right? K-means, K-clustering, really like fancy math terms where we can now pick out these non-human heartbeats that viruses trigger to maintain connection back to China, back to Russia. So we, when we threat hunt, we are looking for those non-human indicators of compromise. The level you can talk about it, Gordon, are you seeing that? Are you seeing our major adversaries involved in that stuff? I mean, absolutely. It's, I, I personally believe it's escalated to a point of almost sheer chaos, right? You accept that your social security number is online and I could go pay three bucks for it. You're right. Yeah. And I, I, our social security numbers aren't even really relevant anymore. Excuse me. <coughs> our medical records are worth more. Our medical records are like 45 bucks now online. But pretty much everyone listening, everyone who may view this in the future, all of our children are at this point where they've probably been compromised in some way. Yeah. And our adversaries are interested in attacking all the web applications associated with the USIPs, getting a hold of databases and dumping those on the internet. Ransomware. This is another like escalating problem. If if someone clicks on something now, 
or opens a document with a macro and unfortunately runs that macro. Your entire environment's data may get ransomed. And that, that is a horrible place to be. I, I don't know how we can honestly take that step back and better secure US systems. So I think instead we have to take that step sideways, better educate, better understand what's going on and move all of us forward. I, I, it's, it's a serious challenge. It makes me paranoid and I live in this state of paranoia, yeah. but if I can tell everyone anything, freeze your credit, freeze your children's credit, like lock these things down. Your social security numbers are available online and that is terrifying. Yeah, it's, terrifying. Yeah, it's just, you. yeah, they're for sale. It, it, I don't know. We live in, uh, one last point on that. We live in what we would call assumed compromise. So if I live in assumed compromise, I know that my social security number is out there, so I'm going to freeze my credit and my wife's credit and my children's credit. Um, my credit card numbers are out there. So there's a site called privacy.com. I can take my credit card, work with privacy.com, and every time I want to purchase something online that's not Amazon, privacy.com will issue me a one-time use credit card number. Hmm. One-time use, right? Interesting. So th these basic steps of how we operate really, I think, need to be pushed down in education to happen earlier. So we've got a great relationship with Rapid City Schools, and they have us talk all the time to their kids. And they, wow. and they love it and really react well to, like, what do you do for a living? You're a hacker? Oh, yeah. my gosh. And so, yeah, a lot of that is, is basic to someone who does this for a living. But really, like, I think it needs to be pushed down to happen earlier in our education. I should have mentioned from the beginning, everybody, um, please feel free to add your questions into the chat. Uh, this is interesting to me, and hopefully it is to you. I'm going to ask a bunch more questions, but uh, feel free to ask at any time, and I'll, I'll watch those. Uh, so, Jordan, you guys uh, have even done some education for Elevate Rapid City um, in the past, and, and I, I've seen it in a couple different spots. So, I mean, you, you talk about just the, the basics of how horrible we are at setting passwords. It's yeah, absolutely. a fascinating discussion. Yeah, passwords are uh, a painful, just a painful rite of passage for most of EHIS customers. And here's why. You hire me. Mitch, I am going to come to your organization and I'm going to guess passwords. And you know what is really awful about that? If I have 20 or 30, 100 users, I'm going to probably recover summer 2020. Summer 2020 exclamation point, July 2020, some month iteration. Unfortunately, this constant cycle, if you have to change your password every 90 days, and it's got to be eight characters and have a special with an upper, right? Those aren't working anymore. That is, that is a very thin veil of security that is really these days winning this battle for adversaries, right? If you remember the John Podesta hack, it's a bad password. If you remember... A lot of these credential theft is huge. And if I can get a hold of a set of credentials, I can go find your VPN portal and log in. And it's, can you detect that stuff? And most people can, unfortunately. Yeah. So instead, we suggest the use of phrases, all right? Learning, like, Elevate Rapid City isn't bad if you misspell something intentionally or you capitalize, leave spaces in, you're at 20 characters, which is practically impossible to guess. It's just learning a different way to handle your passwords. If you don't want to try to remember 50 passwords, get a password manager and then remember a single phrase, uh, Bible verse, song lyrics, your trip down the 101 today, put together a great phrase and then implement two factor, right? So last pass, one password. I talked about this with Andy in that interview. You've got to have a password manager these days. It's, you know, one of those basic things, basic personal hygiene. If your accounts online share a password, guess what happens when your email gets compromised? Not only do I have access to a whole bunch of other accounts, if you left a bad password without two-factor on your email, we can go reset all of your passwords and turn on two-factor on your email that's linked to your adversary's device. And you're locked out. So it's, it's, passwords are rough. And software exploits, okay, let's take a step back now. BHIS is often tasked with running a vulnerability scan. 
This vulnerability scan is really, really great at finding software exploits. But software exploits are way down because most systems now auto update themselves and reboot and do all that stuff. But password attacks are rising. So we are winning more often with credentials than we are with software exploits on the outside of networks. And it's, it's, a, it's a serious challenge. Now, culturally, we aren't in this mindset of using good passwords. So we haven't really learned, even as individuals yet. So now we go to an, a corporation like Ascend Innovation, we tell you, you need to increase your password policy to 15 characters. You look at me like I'm crazy. Your employees will mutiny. Yeah. And so we are fighting this battle of, I as an individual hate long passwords, I can't remember them. Now I tell you as a company, here, you gotta improve all your passwords across the board. You look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. And, Finding that gray space is being filled now with education. So BHIS has also put in this training initiative where so many of our customers have asked us to explain why and then show us, yeah. prove us wrong. Like, why do I need good passwords? I'll hire us for a pen test. We'll show you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, on, on that note, we've got a question. Do you have a recommended password storage or manager to use? Sure. Is it something worth paying for? Absolutely. So LastPass is one that I use, and then I also use one digit one password. Both of these are very reasonable, six to eight bucks a month. I don't, I don't see that as being a huge investment if it allows you to you know, clean up your personal life online, tighten up those passwords, start learning how to use that password manager in your, in your browsers. Now, your mobile device also has a LastPass client, so you can use LastPass if you need that stuff on your mobile. Uh, one password again is great. It, it just depends on your needs, but definitely start somewhere. And another really great feature about LastPass, let me tell you. If a site is compromised, LastPass will tell you, hey, this site was just identified in a breach. Guess what? Do you want me to rotate your password for you? Or do you want to go change your story? Wow. So, love last pass. Uh, let's let's switch gears. I got uh, the article that Jordan was in in the Elevate magazine. Check it out if you haven't. Um, you're quoted here as saying, "My boss knows if I could pay for health insurance and take care of business, I would throw my computer in the trash." <laughs> That's not fair. But yes, he does absolutely, and I think he does the same thing, right? John raises cattle. He's got chickens. Wife maintains bees. Like they, they are also relatively pragmatic in their perspective on maintenance of livestock and food production, right? So, yeah, I said that, and I meant it. Like, I, if I could, if I li if we lived in a, a, a system where I could have healthcare and I could produce enough jars of pickles to like sell on the streets and pay my bills, I would totally bail on the computer. I would disconnect as much as I could, which is 90%. Is that more from a, like, it's a scary world or because Absolutely. you just... Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the surveillance. I mean, we live, we live in a surveillance day, right? So I, I'm reading a book called Surveillance Capitalism, which is super painful. I, I would not recommend it to anyone. But the author is basically taking the perspective that everything we do now online is in some way captured by some company to go make profit. Right? So you go to Facebook. Facebook is very interested in what you click on. Your yeah. location services on your mobile device are collected by every single app you install. Yeah. When you check that permissions box, now all of those companies are selling my location data. I don't, I don't want that. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of that. Right. But that's a personal thing. Again, I live very paranoid and very, like, very different. So I suppose you see it more than the rest of us. But, I mean, <laughs> but, but gardening is also a passion of yours that kind of relates yeah, to that. Right? It is. Yeah, that goes back a long time. I remember my granddad. That, that's no joke. I remember my granddad and his jars of pickles when I was a kid. He also used to maintain box windows so he could start a little earlier. So he had square frame box windows. And during the morning, he would come out and he would roll open the windows and let the little tomatolings get some air. And, get some, and then at night, he'd roll them down and wow. close them. So you had these little mini greenhouse things. So Andy came over and saw my greenhouse and checked it out. Yeah, if you want to talk about passion, like I am very passionate. We made pickles a couple nights ago, which was my fifth batch this year. So we keep picking and I'm at you know, 70 or 80 jars so far. 
salsa. We're going to make salsa. Nice. I've got about 40 or 50 tomatoes that need jarred up. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Okay, I better get back on, on topic here. Um, you recommend things like Dashlane for password storing. Dashlane is great. I have not seen a bad thing about it. Okay. So we usually hear bad stuff. We don't hear great stuff because our team loves when any one of our testers, there's about 25 of us who are very invested in the latest security thing. When someone finds a vulnerability or a risk in a system or service, guess what? All of us hear about it right away and then there's some chatter about it. How do you exploit it? You know, what, how do we take advantage of that? And I have never seen that. So that's good. Okay. Like we found an interesting one with say Duo. <clears throat> Duo runs two-factor. If, if you don't have two-factor in your environment on your systems and servers, let's say Elevate, Duo is the easiest and quickest solution to get two-factor. Basically, you, you put an app on your phone, you install Duo on your servers, anywhere you can authenticate. When you enter your username and password on the Elevate server, you now get a push notification on your device. So something you know, something you have. Sure. That's two-factor. That is yeah, strongly recommended. Okay. But I bring up Duo because we worked with them when we found something. We found a way to get around their two-factor. We called them, and within hours, they acknowledged us, gave us great, like, thank you so much, and solved the problem, okay. right? And that's what we want. Right. A lot of companies aren't that forthcoming. Sure. Yeah. Duo. Your own weekend, right? yeah. Duo is great. Hey, great, thanks for the question. I don't think this is a dumb question. I, I, I want the same. Uh, so how do digital password keepers that seem like they could be hacked oh, yeah. with one password, uh, not with a single password, sure. um, compared to keeping yeah. your password on a piece of paper in a safe? That's great. I'm gonna grab it. Oh. So to log into my password manager, not only do I have to have my 25 character password, I have to have this device right here. This is called a YubiKey, which is U2F, meaning universal two-factor. So Okay, this is just my end. I think the question here is more, why would you trust someone with all your passwords? But basically, I enter my username and password. It tells me, plug this thing in and press the button. This is gonna be a fingerprint soon. So they have a new one coming out that is also mapped to my fingerprint. Sure. But why do I trust LastPass? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know of a better way. <laughs> and this is that paranoid state of being. Yeah. Our company went through the motions with, four or five password managers. What risks are there? What are all the pros? What are the cons? How have they handled vulnerabilities and risks in the past? And we settled on, you know, LastPass, 1Password, um, Zoho. Uh, we looked at Dashlane, but those top three, we really, we said, you know, they're as trustworthy as anything out there. Yeah, I, I won't get into it, but I have always thought, like, so what if one person gets my 1Password? Now they have all of them, but... Yeah, that's why we do two-factor, right? Sure. That, that's that secondary something you have. Another question here. Uh, without revealing too much about any specific company, are there any issues that Black Hills Information Security has found and fixed that you consider a solid win yeah, or that you're particularly proud of? Okay, let's. I'm going to phrase the question back to the asker. A win from an adversarial perspective, like we, we try to keep our tests non-adversarial, but I would be the adversary. Sure. Is that, I mean, do you want me to tell some war stories? Because I've got some great ones. Uh, let's start with uh, a fix. Like you went in and like, okay. well, there was a Absolutely. vulnerability that we were able to really recognize. So we had an insurance company ask us to come test their cloud. Cloud is huge now, right? You got Microsoft Cloud, which is Azure and Office 365 and uh, AWS, so Amazon's web services. We, we basically went in and found, it's a cluster technology that handles large sets of data, okay? And Amazon has these really co cool features called like expansion, elastic expansion. If you hit some threshold in your system, new ones get spun off. And what we found was they were spinning up vulnerable. So every single time a new cluster came online, it was vulnerable to full compromise. And compromise meaning the entire set of data underlying that database. Amazon wasn't really like, okay, Amazon has this model called client responsibility 
Amazon secures the hardware and the location and the people who maintain that data and make sure the disks keep spinning. The customer is responsible for security of all the services there, right? So the customer responsibility model. This happened to fall above it because this is a service you're deploying. Yes, we're spinning it up vulnerable, but it is yours. And, and this customer now is fully cloud focused, has hired cloud engineering, and is so much better prepared to handle their cloud infrastructure after they invited us to come in, demonstrate risk. And what we do is demonstrate risk, usually very effectively. Now, I have done things like sit in a pizza shop, take pictures of the badges, the badges, whatever people are wearing, duplicated those badges, picked locks on the outside of buildings, changed clothes in stairwells, and for some customers, that is a huge win. Demonstrate where we are vulnerable. So now they up their exterior security game. They implemented policies that limited where people could wear their badges. You can't walk across the street to the pizza shop wearing badges because I took a picture of it, cloned it in my hotel room, used it, broke into the company, and spent three days there. Wow. But to them, also Midwest friendly, no one said a word. They just smiled and waved at us outside their building, picking locks because we had on the badge, <laughs> right? Wow. But demonstrating that kind of risk is, for some customers, a huge win and really what they want. Yeah, absolutely. I think you told me that uh, in the physical side, one of your um, most effective is just to leave a jump drive on somebody's desk. Absolutely. And that is horrifying still. So we mark those. We have a little printer that says, you know, finance or HR or payroll. If you leave that on a USB drive laying around, guess what? 90% of the time, people are going to plug it in. And these auto-run services, right? Plug it in, things happen, and guess what? We call them shells. Shells rain out of networks. Another great one. Okay, that brings up another point. We were hired for a physical. We realized they were having a booth day, like an outdoor event. We set up and rented space for a booth. We handed out uh, coupons that were 50% off our healthcare product. Let me tell you, those emails, like people forwarding around the coupon codes and pictures of this, left the organization. It, <laughs> it was one of the most effective ruses we had ever pulled off. A link to a website? Yep. That, that compromises you. Okay. Download the coupon, open the coupon. And, and, and but that had the effect of not only that company, but yes, people outside there. Now you implement it. policies and procedures that control all third party access to your organization, right? Sure. You can't just come be at our outdoor fair. Yeah. Uh, we fix this problem of, okay, holy cow, we probably ought to look at what's leaving our network sure. because if you click on this document, it connects out to my cloud system where I now have control of that computer. So, yeah, yeah series of command and control, and then plus implementing policies and procedures to fix all these things. Uh, many more here, but i uh, love to hear from, from all of you. Uh, so then, oh, phone screen. Apologize to everyone for that. Wow. Excellent, no problem. Thought I had all that shut down. Uh, we're running a tight ship around here. Yeah, good, <laughs> good, I feel that. We are too. Um, <laughs> So, so tell me a little bit about uh, your operations here in the incubator. And sure. Kind of, you mentioned your interns and, and things like that. What what goes on here? And and maybe you're. I mean, there's a little bit of risk, I suppose, in having interns, right? I mean, kind of getting oh, in here. Yeah. There's risk in everything, sure. and we we vet our interns very interestingly because we wonder if someone's going to try to get access to our company's internals from an adversary, right? We wonder if the Russians are gonna to try to get an implant on the inside of our company. So when we do things like review resumes, it's, okay, can we really vet this person? In? And then we run OSINT, which is open source intelligence gathering, okay. meaning what can we find out about this person? Are they really who they say they are? Because we're in a situation where, fine, yes, we have to double check all that. We have to verify that. Which, okay, is not what you're asking. But here at Ascent, we have a gigantic password cracking rate. Yeah. That's our that's our like heart and soul here. So this is a mathematically intensive computational system. 
So we do a lot of password cracking. I mean, probably right now there's three or four testers using that system to crack passwords. And when I say crack passwords, basically we get a hold of credential material. Any solid database administrator, when you put in your new username and password, is going to generate a hash on the back end, yeah. not a clear text password. When we get a hold of those hashes, which you'd be shocked how often we do, we send them to our cracking rig, which runs a ton of cycles. And then we have creds, right? Now we have a username and a password gathered from a password cracking rig hosted here to send innovation, which to us has been really like a glorious thing. I think we showed the governor when she stopped by and yeah, like, oh, that's really wild. Yeah. Kent and Derek maintained that. So we had Kent in here last year. And another thing we do in there is training and webinars. So we have, geez, I think we're up to two or three webinars a week oh, wow. between Wild West Hack and Fest and Black Hills InfoSec. And so that is us bringing in our camera equipment, which is pretty, actually pretty lightweight, audio gear, and then spending time in that really nicely provisioned open space. We hope we get something similar as active countermeasures someday. Yeah. We'll see. And then we run webinars. In our webinars, we'll see a thousand people now, 1,200, who come spend, I don't know, an hour with us and banter about infosec topics of the day. Uh, Kent and I, for Defensive Origins, on behalf of Black Hills Infosec, ran our training course in there. So we tell everybody, hey, we're going to take the room with the doors that close. Kent and I go in there, and we deliver virtual online training to 100 students at a time. So this space has been, um, I would say, more than useful and more than a solid contributor to the growth of PHIS. And again, that, that birth of active, active countermeasures, which was wholly the result of John's theories, customer demands, and then the mathematical minds here at yeah. Minds. Right. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Glad to have you guys here for sure, and it's been a great relationship. Uh, you, must, you mentioned Wild West Hackenfest. I mean, I, and I know that's become almost a year-round thing, but I mean, yep. in, a, in a normal non-COVID year, you get a lot of people in Deadwood for that as well. Yeah, we do. I know, and we miss it so much. Uh, the last one we ran was end of 2019, so we ran it the same time as Dead Weird in Deadwood, and we brought 700 people out. Filled every hotel, filled all the Airbnbs, any place you could find a room in that Northern Hills region was full of somebody trying to learn hacking. Some hacker with a laptop, who knows? It was, it was a wild experience. And that, that felt like the top end for us. So this year we were gonna reduce it a little. We even started a second one. So now we have Way West Hacking Fest. We have a location in San Diego where when we can get back together and hang out with people, we'll be doing something similar. And we, we like to think this is the most hands-on hacking conference, right? Hacking conferences are very common now, but that one we had at Doors Lab. So we called the Doors Lab the Hall of Doors, meaning it was seven doors secured seven different ways. One, you could bypass with a particular entry. Another, you could pick through. Another, there was a digital reader on the outside. So you had to find the BHIS employee who had the badge that worked on that door. Uh, it, it, so it was a lot of fun. Really, yeah. it was a lot of fun. Well, two things there. That is awesome that you're bringing that large of a group to the Black Hills, you know, and, and we, we should leverage that even more so in the future. And two, that's really scary to me in a way for some reason to think about 700 hackers all in the same <laughs> spot and like, like with it's the potential to, all, to work, too, Mitch. all work on the same thing at the same time or something. Yeah, it's scary to us too. But that brings up questions of morals and ethics. Sure. And we have these conversations internally all the time. Should we release this latest code that we're using that bypasses all antivirus products and, and does this stuff? Should we work with the vendor? And our general take on that is share everything. So we have this, if we're really honestly trying to make the world a better place, we're not gonna hide things we do. We share almost everything. And some of our special sauce, stays internal, mm -hmm. but even that, right, like bleeds out over time. Yeah. And these techniques and, and things we do to bypass security controls, that stuff goes to the vendors as soon as we find it. 
we release code as soon as we you know have determined it's safe to release uh, unfortunately we've seen our things used in the news and that's never anything you want to see so if you searched silent trinity exploit you're going to find that a government was taken down an eastern european government was taken down using some variation of this code and then we have that whole come to Jesus moment of we need to probably talk about this. Like, is everything okay? Have we done enough? Are we doing enough? Are we releasing too much? Where do we stop? And yeah, it's, we're trying to push the edge, which moves security forward. And I think finally in five years, I can say that security is better. Microsoft Defender is a perfectly acceptable antivirus solution for any of us. I think, I think really, truly, people are starting to understand two-factor. And maybe public wireless isn't the best place to leave your phone on. And I think, I think some of these very basic things are actually improving. Yeah. Uh, a current event question. Yeah. Should we, should, we be, should we be suspicious of apps like TikTok? Sure. There is an absolutely amazing technical write-up on the Black Hills blog. And I hate to plug products. I hate to push people toward our blog. But one of our testers basically did a deep dive. And why? Because he's got kids, he saw it in the news, and he wanted to know. And he came to the same conclusion that we do about most apps. Is TikTok collecting data about you? Yeah, just about the same as everything else. When you check that permissions box for, let it use my location data, grab my contact information, phone numbers, maybe, maybe that text message one shouldn't be there, but should you be suspicious of TikTok? No more than anything else you install on your phone and allow. I know that the US government's um, opinion on it is that because it's Chinese owned, the Chinese government could force that data into their hands. But that's probably not any different in your eyes than anybody else, right? Yeah, I, I think that's about accurate. Now, I personally have the Verizon Kids plan and it's not allowed, right? Okay. My kids are not allowed to have that device, that, that on their devices. So I only have one kid with a cell phone right now, and we're really working through what Verizon Kids looks like. Sure. But there's no way. But use it. They're just for other reasons, for sure, yeah, I think, too. Exactly. You know, it's very well done. It is. Not just the hacking prompt. But yeah. I would be nervous installing anything. I think I have three or four additional apps than what come on my Samsung, and it's... You know, I got the star maps, which guess what? Has permissions to my flashlight. <laughs> Why? I, I have no idea. Why can it listen to my microphone? I, who knows? I've got an authenticator app, which is, I can show you here real quick, another way to do two-factor. And um, let's see, long pin. I think Kent's got the company record at a 22-character pin on his phone. So let me, sorry, so he types 22 characters every time, every he, time he unlocks his phone. Wow. So what we have here, see if we can get that zoomed in. This is an authenticator app. And these are all the services where if I go log in, I get prompted. And it says, what, what is your authenticator code telling you to type in right here? And then I think I've probably got one more app. I'm trying to think what it even is. I just, I don't do apps because I'm like I'm a paranoid individual. And I, I don't know. I like it. <laughs> Hopefully we're not just scaring everybody away. But we do have another question uh, from Mike. Hackers are constantly evolving. What are the next generation threats and defense methods we need to start thinking about? What is what is beyond changing your passwords, staying off public Wi-Fi, and not opening attachments? Oh, I love this. This is fantastic. So let's pick this apart piece by piece. Um, I remember Mike rollerblading in my friend's backyard in 1992, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, next generation threats. What are we dealing with? We're, we're still dealing with the same threats because we haven't handled them. They work, right? Yeah. Yeah, they work. <laughs> if I can guess passwords against your company, which I can probably find most of your employees on LinkedIn. So I go find your employees on LinkedIn. I find your login portal, which is probably Microsoft online and guess passwords slowly. If I'm an adversary, I'm going slow and you're probably not going to catch it. How do we detect that? That is what Kent and I teach. We teach legit detections of pen tester activities, meaning if I password spray your network, how do you catch that? Here's what Windows 
threat optics look like? And when I say threat optics, I mean, how do you see as an administrator of a network, of a business, how do you see what is going on in your endpoints? So that's what Kent and I teach. Now, beyond changing passwords, staying off public Wi-Fi and not opening attachments, the browser is the next most serious threat, in my opinion. Your web browser is this thin veneer of security between you and your home network and this world wide web, which is really in actuality horrific and a gigantic disaster of, I mean, up the utmost epic proportions. <laughs> and we place Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, Chrome in between us and that. Okay. So now, browser plugins, things like Ghostery, Ghost E R Y, U Block Origin. Add block plus, no script. Um, there's, there's just layers of protection that we should begin the process of understanding. This is stuff we even push down to the fourth graders, fifth graders we talk to. And they, they love it, but I'm not sure they're getting it all, right? We love talking about it, and they love hearing it. The password thing, I think they accept really a lot better than the adults we talk to about this problem. All I need to do is a phrase? Oh, hey. And don't share? So passwords are like underwear, right? Change them often and don't share. <laughs> so kids, eat that up, right? That's an easy one. But, yeah, it's... What else you got in here? Staying off public Wi-Fi, anything else? Yeah, so treat your browser as a, a, what it is, and that is a thin, thin veneer of protection between you your home, and the internet, which is a very scary place. Uh, well, preferred browser? Uh, I don't have a preferred browser. I use, okay, so three options. Chrome collects data, basically a spyware tool, right? Google loves collecting information about us. Chromium, which is a, a skinnier, tightened-down version that now Microsoft Edge is based on. So Chromium. And Firefox. Firefox is, oh, and that brings me to the other app I have on my phone I'll talk about in just a second. So Firefox, in my opinion, is, is the browser I choose because of the ideals they espouse. They say, we're not interested in tracking. Hey, it's okay to like Facebook. Use our Facebook container. We will keep Facebook from gathering information about your computer, about your mobile device. Now, search engines, right? Everything you search in Google Chrome is tracked and maintained forever. So Google has a history about you. If you have your phone authenticated to Google, it will tell you everywhere you've been in your entire history of that device, your other devices, anywhere you've been logged in. And uh, I prefer DuckDuckGo. So, yeah, DuckDuckGo is the browser I use on my phone. So that is the other app I have. And I also have their privacy extension. So it tells me, it basically grades every site I go to. It's either an A, B, C, D, and, and then it'll tell you. This site is collecting a ridiculous amount of data about you. Like yeah. Twitter, D. Google, D. But Firefox.com, A. Okay. Yeah, so it, it, there's a lot we can do, definitely. What else you got? Every time I have a conversation with you guys, uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm simultaneously so fascinated that it, <sighs> and, they're, and they're so awesome. And then, I mean, for like a, like a day, I'm scared. And then yes. I go back to like putting my blinders on. And As just, you should. You know, like. We can't, li okay. And this is another, you bring up a great point. We call it uh, the scale of doing business and life. On one end is utter paralyzing paranoia. On the other end is I don't care. Right, and we're all somewhere in that gray sure. space. It's finding the balance in life of how often do I actually need credit checks? How often? When was the last time you bought a car? Right. Sure. That's you call the credit providers and say, "Hey, I need you to unlock this for three hours. Here's my pin." They unlock your credit for three hours, you run the credit check, you're back in business. I need a one-time use credit card number to buy something that's not from Amazon. Go to privacy.com, log in with two-factor. Get your one-time issue, and it's done, right? I mean, we're introducing inconvenience in some ways, 
in lieu of lack of security. So I, my strong recommendation, if you could do anything right now, freeze your credit. It's free, it's easy, and it may save you that identity theft that takes you to the cleaners and ruins the next six months of your life. I mean, I'm either going to ask this on camera or off, I guess. You, you circled back to that. And so, so what actually does that look like? How, how do you do that? Yeah, you go to Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. It's funny because Equifax was totally, absolutely demolished by hackers, right? Their database was cleaned out. I think 150 million American social security numbers, addresses, dates of birth were dumped because of an Equifax breach. Yet we still have to rely on them as one of the top three credit bureaus. Sure. So this, <laughs> it's really frustrating. And you still have to go to them and freeze your credit. And you, go to their website. You, go, you go to these three providers' websites and you freeze your credit. It's basically a set up a pin. Uh, I apologize. Let's take this. Prove who you are, set up a pin, and then, you know, how do you want to unlock? It's, it's, I think it's three steps. Okay. And your credit is frozen. And no one, theoretically, no one should be able to credit check and open new lines of credit in your name. Okay. Okay. So, so then you're getting, applying for a car loan or a mortgage or a, yep. a, a new credit card. Yep. You're going to have to go to those three places again. Yep. Unlock it for a short time. Okay. Yep. That's really inconvenient. I know. It is, isn't it? All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. We're, we'll, we'll, uh, Pontificate for another minute here. If anybody has, has one more, um, and then we'll give you back a little bit of your of your day. Uh, Jordan, this has been just just awesome. It always Thank is. You, sir. I appreciate it very much. Um, you know, you guys are doing amazing things. Uh, you know, clearly uh, experts in the industry. Um, Thank you. you know, the, I mean, the, the educational parts of our our discussions are are always amazing. Um, just understanding that, but um, at the same time, <clears throat> you know, the 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 level. I mean the the ranking you have in your industry while being a Black Hills company, uh, I, I think should go more noticed. And I know you guys- It, it for, absolutely should. Uh, and, and I know for some reasons, you don't necessarily wanna, you know, be, have your corporate headquarters with the big sign and stuff, you know what I mean? But, uh, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that you still will occasionally jump on one of these with us and, and, and get in the magazine and things like that, because it, it's just, it, it, it blows my mind that we have this kind of company um, right here in our backyard. And uh, so um, yeah. to, to John Strand and, and, and Derek and Kent and all of those guys and, and you as well, um, we appreciate you guys being around here. Hope you stay a long time. Hope you continue you to expand, expand and all that. And uh, um, since there's no more questions, um, thanks to all of you for, for joining us. Uh, again, you can see the full, um, there's probably reasons why you want to see this recording for sure. You need to go back and, and get those tips Double again. Check some things. Yeah. Um, so go to the YouTube Elevate Rapid City uh, page, subscribe. Um, it'll be up there on that recording. Uh, let's make sure everybody can, can find you guys if they want to yep. be want to be your customer. Where do they go to find all your companies? Absolutely. Consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com is the email address where you can talk to our one, one more time slowly. Consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com. I N F O S E C. Okay. We also have a website blackhillsinfosec.com or the shortened version bhis dot co. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Mitch knows how to get a hold of us. If you have any questions, any concerns, you can talk to us directly. We try to be open and available to anyone who needs help. Yeah. With that, Jordan. Oh. Um, let me give you a elbow bump here. And uh, thanks, Andy. Thanks for, thanks for being on here, and uh, thanks, Andy, for sending us a message that. Um, really threw me off there for a second, but uh, appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, we're gonna get off here. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Thank you all.